If you want to understand exactly what a binary is, I guess it makes sense to start off with something that everyone agrees is a binary. See, the issue is there are a lot of concepts where people will deny that it is, in any meaningful sense, actually a binary, which makes it quite difficult to establish what a binary is, right? Because I might give an example of something that's a binary in order to help explain what a binary is, only for the person I'm talking to to then say, well, that's not even actually a binary. So we're going to start off with something really basic, and that's why I'm currently writing down a load of ones and zeros, because this is binary, right? It's the purest, reified expression of binary that isn't just the abstract notion of binarity itself. Obviously abstract concepts aren't found in the material world, but this string of ones and zeros now exists in the real world, and this is a binary. Nobody could possibly disagree that this is a binary, right? Well, no. Not if you're going to follow some people's logic. Fortunately, I'm in a great position to make this point because I have pretty bad handwriting, so it's very clear that none of these zeros are the same, nor are any of these ones. Even if I had really good consistent handwriting, they'd still be off by some amount. So this isn't a choice between two different numbers, it's a choice between as many numbers as I wrote down, since this zero is different from this zero. But it gets worse because my handwriting is so bad that some of these ones are are kind of curvy, while some of these zeros have portions where the lines are straight. And definitely there are moments where the ones are more curvy or the zeros are more straight, but a one is made up of exclusively straight lines, while a zero has zero straight lines and is a consistent curve. That is at least what a zero and a one should be, so maybe there's no such thing as a one or a zero in reality. After all, once you get down to the width of a pixel, any zero found on a computer screen will have some straight lines on it. Maybe ones and zeros are ideals that don't actually exist. Certainly, if nothing else though, we can say that these written zeros have straight portions and these written ones have curvy portions. So doesn't this mean that some of my zeros have bits of one in them? and some of my ones have bits of zero in them, or that at least as the curves of my zero get straighter, they're approaching oneness. Also, considering I don't always fully close the circle in my O's, maybe some of them are much more like ones than they are like other zeros. Maybe, in fact, what I've actually written here is a spectrum. Now, just for the record, this is me being intentionally silly. Obviously this is a binary, it's, as already discussed, the best example we have of binary in the real world. It's literally called binary code. That it's only made up of two parts is kind of its defining attribute. And yet, I have just argued that binary code isn't actually binary, it's a spectrum. The issue is, I was doing so using poor logic the exact kind of logic that people use every day to deny real-world binaries. They'll say, well, there's more than just male and female. After all, males are so different and have so much variation. No two females are identical. And indeed, there are some males who have female attributes and vice versa. And you could argue that as a male has more and more female attributes, he is approaching femaleness such that male and female exist in a continuum separated from each other only by a matter of degrees. The point is, people who are set on denying that anything is a binary will be able to do so using spurious logic, even if that spurious logic entails that nothing is a binary, even binary code itself. But in reality, everything is a binary, literally everything, because x and not x is a binary when x can stand for anything in the world. King critical and not king critical is a binary. You and not you is a binary. A binary is when you only have two choices, and there is no possible choice you could make other than x or not x. This feature of a binary is, by the way, what makes it fundamentally different from a ternary or trinary if you like. Obviously you can have discrete categorizations with three options, or four or five, but it is only a binary that is able to capture the fundamental distinction between presence and absence. Something is either there or it's not. 
There is no third possible option in that dichotomy. This is to say that a binary is not distinguished from a greater number of choices entirely just by a matter of degree. You might be noticing this is getting pretty philosophical, and if that excites you, then I have some good news, and some bad news, and some good news. The good news is that I actually decided to do a lot of research into the philosophy of the concept of a binary. The bad news is that there actually isn't much academic philosophy around the concept of a binary itself, which was kind of surprising. I was thinking that considering how significant the distinction is between spectra and binaries, and how recurring binaries are in so many aspects of the human experience, that somebody would have written the definitive book on the concept of the binary. But nobody has, so it looks like it falls to me. Add this to the growing list of things that I surely thought somebody else would have done, but nobody has done, so I guess I've got to do it. Any university presses watching this, hit me up, I can stretch this video out to a book, no problem. Anyway, trying to find literally anything about binaries was a quest in itself. I was on JSTOR trying all sorts of different combinations of keywords just to find some information about binaries that wasn't directly related to computer programming. By the way, if you do appreciate this kind of effort, then you're of course welcome to give on Patreon, and I would like to give a massive thanks to those who are already contributing on Patreon. You are a huge help and you're very much appreciated. And even when I did find philosophical articles talking about binaries, they usually weren't discussing the concept of a binary in itself, but rather discussing other concepts with a mind towards whether or not those were binaries. So clearly, the concept of a binary is important. It's important enough that you can find all sorts of articles written by philosophers about whether or not ethics or consciousness or existence or truth is a binary, but nobody actually talking about what they really mean when they talk about something being a binary. This book behind me is all about metaphysics, so I was thinking, surely this has something to do with binaries in it. Annoyingly and insanely, it doesn't have an index. So I was thinking, am I going to have to scan through this whole book? But fortunately, I found an online PDF, so I was able to just control effort, and no results at all for the word binary. This book about metaphysics, about basically the fundamental reality of existence doesn't contain even a passing mention of one of the main ways that we conceive of differences in our reality. In the end, I thought, well, surely somebody must have written about the Chinese idea of Taiji, that the universe is fundamentally dualistic and composed entirely of binaries in balance. And once I started searching for this, it ended up being much more productive. So, so much for the idea that binaries are just a white European colonial imposition. Take that, queer theory. Asia's on my side. Thing is, even once you've found a load of articles about the thing you're looking for, you're not necessarily out of the woods yet, because those articles still have to have something of value to say. This is something that the climate of university doesn't prepare you for, because in university, if you just find some academic article talking about the concept, you can reference it and probably get a good grade. But if what you're actually interested in is discovering the truth, it matters that these articles are actually saying something insightful. Like, I found this one article called The Uses of Binary Thinking by Peter Albo, and at one point he says, Many voices argue that wherever there are polar oppositions, there is dominance. Some classic terms are day slash night, sun slash moon, reason slash passion, and of course, lurking behind all these pairs is usually gender, male slash female. According to this critique, binary thinking almost always builds in dominance or privilege. So obviously this is nonsense, right? As we've already established, everything is a binary. So saying that conceiving of something as a binary engenders a particular type of thinking doesn't really make much sense if that particular type of thinking applies to literally everything. But I was interested in how is this article going to deal with the fact that often we don't have these ideas of dominance or submission in our conception of binaries, and I was a bit disappointed to see it just say, yeah, nah. Turns out you can just conceive of binaries in all sorts of different ways, which I agree with, but it just felt a bit anticlimactic. Anyway, the actual article I was interested in talking about right now is Structural Relations and Analogies in Classical Chinese Logic by Jana Roska. I'll link both the articles from which I derived anything useful in the description below, and you're welcome to check them out. Also, if you happen to find any other articles dealing with the concepts of binaries, then please let me know, because I'd love to read them. The literature review for my forthcoming book on binaries is currently looking dismally thin. But I actually thought this was 
was kind of interesting. The Mois thus asserted that the criterion for distinguishing the sameness or difference between individual objects should be how general the possession or non-possession of a given attribute was. It was wrong to distinguish an ox from a horse because it has teeth, whereas a horse has a tail. Teeth are not a unique specific characteristic of oxen, just as tails are not a unique feature of horses. But distinguishing them because oxen have horns, while horses do not, is likewise wrong, for horns are not a differentia specifica of oxen, but also a characteristic of sheep and goats. Only a unique feature can serve as a criterion for distinguishing objects within a certain kind. Now, for the record, I'm not entirely sure I agree with this, but I thought it was an interesting idea because it's basically saying that you can only distinguish two things if the means by which you're distinguishing them also distinguishes whatever it is you're identifying from everything else as well. I was a bit worried that this would contradict what I was saying, that everything is a binary because X and non-X is a binary, because I was thinking, well, am I in doing that distinguishing non-X from everything else it could possibly be? And then I realized, well, of course I am, because the only other thing it could possibly be is X, which we've established it isn't. And I realized this works for all binaries because the whole point of a binary is that by showing that it is not the other option of a binary, you are necessarily distinguishing it from anything else it could possibly be. So basically the Chinese idea is saying that we could only distinguish between X and Y by appealing to an attribute that also distinguishes Y from anything else it could possibly be. But if X and Y are a binary, then X is the only other possible thing that Y could be. But since we've established that Y is not X by establishing it's on the other side of the binary, we have, in doing so, distinguished it from from everything else that it could possibly be because there were only two things it could possibly be because it was a binary. So in summary, basically the Chinese are still on my side and it would seem that broadly speaking, East and West are in agreement both on the nature of binaries and also what would constitute a binary. But this is all philosophical and very much dealing with binaries in abstract. And you may be interested in binaries in the real world beyond just defining binaries into existence in the real world by literally saying a given thing and then everything that's not that thing. Like my microphone is a binary because it's part of the binary of my microphone on the one hand and on the other hand, every single thing that isn't my microphone. Boom, binaries exist in the real world, queer theory destroyed. A lot of people treat binaries as if they're just methods that we can utilize to understand things, or else they'll even treat them as rhetorical devices. I remember there was this big push a while ago to basically get rid of the idea of being agnostic by saying that atheist and theist is a binary. If you aren't a theist, you are an atheist. So if you're an agnostic and you say that you don't know, well, if you don't know, then you don't believe, and therefore you are an atheist. And clearly one of the purposes of this was to invent the idea that this is a binary between atheist and theist in order to bolster atheist numbers. What's still open though is the question of whether or not there is anything in the material world that is evidently a binary in itself, meaning the fundamental undeniable material reality of what it naturally is means that we can only reasonably understand it as existing in two possible states. Like, for example, the state of my light switch. The very nature of it and how it works means it only has two possible states, on and off. Of course, you can be difficult. You can be like one of those people who refuses to engage with a philosophical hypothetical in good faith and acts as if every single thought experiment is some kind of video game where they're supposed to discover the glitch that gives you the secret way out. So yes, you could be difficult and insist there's some kind of theoretical quantum state where the light could exist in a neutral state of onfness. But if you're doing that, you're just being difficult and you're not really engaging with the fact that in material reality, you still only have two options. There are, in fact, many examples of natural binaries. Day and night is a binary. Life and death is a binary. The whole X not X thing, uh, I admitted, was a little bit abstract and philosophical, but what it's actually getting at, absence and presence, that's not theoretical, that's not abstract, that's something that we see all the time. There are certain life signs that indicate that somebody is alive. If they are present, that person is alive. If they are absent, that person is dead. Presence, absence. If the sun is in the sky, 
then it is day. If the sun is beyond the horizon and is no longer in the sky, it is night. Two options. Presence, absence. It's a binary. The big feature of a binary that distinguishes it from a spectrum is that the differences between the states are not simply a difference of a matter of degree. But significantly, this does not mean that you can't have one state approaching the other, that you can't have presence approaching absence. If you take the key signs of somebody being alive, these can fluctuate throughout the day. And in that sense, you could say that we're always moving to and fro relative to death, that we are approaching death as our perhaps vitality gets lower, and then at other times we might find that our vitality is increasing and we're moving away from death, and we can talk about people being at death's door. But ultimately, there is a fundamental point at which you cross from being alive to being dead. And that is not just a distinction of a matter of degrees. That's just not just moving along a spectrum from more alive to more dead. You have crossed from one state of affairs to the other. A good example of this is returning back to my lamp. As you can see, it's got a little thing that I can push, and I can actually push it in halfway, and I can hold it like this. And I don't know exactly how this lamp works and exactly how the switch works, but we might imagine that the circuit is getting closer and closer to being closed as I push this along. But no matter how much we can talk about the circuit becoming more closed and this switch being pushed more along, and as such it's getting closer to a different state of being in some sense, none of this really speaks to the fact that when it actually turns on, it has changed to a different state in a much more fundamental sense than it did when we were just pushing it along until it gradually changes. Perhaps the most contentious natural binary I've mentioned so far would be the distinction between day and night. Obviously, we can watch the sun move across the sky. We can watch it go down. We can perceive it getting darker as there's less and less of the sun. But we can still say that the distinction between day and night is a binary question. Is the sun visible in the sky? Is it behind the horizon or is it not? If it's not, it's day. If it's behind the horizon, it's night, even though we can see it approaching a different state of affairs, and we can even see it changing to be more like the other state of affairs, we can still say that it is a binary determined by one question that only has two possible answers. The one obvious point to be made about real-world binaries is that they don't apply to everything. This seems like kind of an obvious point to make, but when I'm talking about the binary of on and off for my lamp, that doesn't apply to my water bottle. Obviously, the life-death binary only applies to organic matter, to living things. We wouldn't talk about, again, my water bottle being dead or alive and existing in that binary. The big question, of course, is when is something still a binary because the things that exist outside of the two options exist outside of the entire categorization itself versus when something ceases to be a binary because there is something that exists outside of two options that should rightly be considered part of the categorization. And here's my good advice for dealing with this delineation yourself, use your common sense, because there'll always be disingenuous people who say nothing's a binary except for what you arbitrarily declare to be one, and then there'll be other people who can say everything's a binary because anything that exists outside of the two binary categorizations is simply not in consideration. Hanging over all this confusion is a common issue with the way a lot of people seem to view the natural world. I've spoken about this many times before, and I've frequently characterized it as the checklist approach and contrasted it with the holistic function approach. The checklist approach can really confuse our understanding of life and death. If you just think that all the vital signs of life are simply a checklist for you to tick off or quantify and measure, and as you tick off various things that somebody does or doesn't have, you find that they perhaps approach death along a continuum until they become dead, not because something has fundamentally changed in their state of being, but rather just because a list of attributes has gradually shifted in one particular direction until, in a much more spectral sense, they enter the dead side of the spectrum. The binary becomes much more apparent once we realize what we're actually interested in is not the nature of the properties themselves, but rather the system that the various properties are working towards, and the function of that system within the organism, which is keeping the individual alive instead of dead. As such, life and death 
isn't about an aggregate of attributes, but rather what the presence of those attributes speaks to overall about the organism. This becomes much easier to understand if we realize that binaries often aren't oppositional, but rather speak to a complementary system. Roska writes, Binarity as such is not a specific feature of Chinese philosophy, for in its differentiating function it constitutes a basic aspect of human thought. However, the Chinese approach to binary relations differs greatly from dualism such as they were developed in the Judeo-Christian tradition, which is characterized by the creation of logocentric binary pattern rooted in the mutual contradiction of both polar opposites, and which tends towards the preservation of one and the elimination of the other pole. And then you can go on to read the rest, but basically it goes on to say that this other type of binary in Eastern philosophy is more about the two working together, yin and yang, obviously. For the record, I think this is wrong. I don't accept that Western thought always imagines binaries as oppositional, nor do I necessarily accept that Eastern thought always considers binaries to be complementary. Rather, I would say that there are some binaries that are more oppositional, and there are some binaries that are more cooperative. I'd even maybe go so far as to say that this distinction between opposition and cooperation operation exists itself on a spectrum, funnily enough. Something like the life-death binary seems very oppositional, the point of being alive is to keep death at bay, every single one of your vital bodily functions right now is fighting to keep you alive as opposed to dead. Yeah, there are some Eastern philosophies that say that actually life and death are part of some wonderful harmonious balance, and I imagine that's a very peaceful thought, but it doesn't seem to cohere with what we tend to observe in the natural world, which is that life desperately does not want to be dead. On the other hand, there are binaries that I think nobody could deny are cooperatives. Take, for example, the binary of left and right in clothing. The point of having a left shoe is not so that the left shoe can dominate and win out, and you can have hundreds of left shoes and no right shoes. The point of having a left shoe is that you have a right shoe so that you can wear a pair of shoes where both shoes fit your feet, because they are organized one around your right foot and one around your left foot. Now yes, you could argue in some deep philosophical sense that every object wants to be itself and as such is striving against being anything else. I believe Spinoza calls this idea canatus, but the point is that a right shoe, yes, exists in opposition to being a left shoe, but it clearly exists to be paired with a left shoe. Anyway, I'll stop with the philosophizing, but feel free to read this quote about the function of binaries in the Hegelian dialectic that also speaks to the way that binaries tend to operate in a system, although this does kind of confuse things by treating the synthesis of these two options as a third thing, which is dumb. Like, that would be like saying that there are three options around which shoes can be oriented, around the left foot, around the right foot, or as a pair of shoes. That's not a third option, it's just the two options working together in a binary system. The working together doesn't count as a third option. That's like saying biological sex is organized around three functions. The function of the small gamete, the function of the large gamete, and the function of both gametes working together to reproduce. That's not a third option, it's just what happens when the binary system works to achieve a singular result. I was trying to avoid speaking about biological sex as I introduced many of the key ideas around a binary because I did want this video to be about the idea of binaries in general rather than being immediately bogged down with all the politics around the idea of whether or not sex is a binary. But that has been really hard because honestly, biological sex is one of the best examples we have of a binary in the natural world. For every single point I've been trying to make about binaries in the natural world, biological sex has been the perfect example I could have appealed to to demonstrate that point. Like, all the examples I gave were basically fine for how a binary is about how you have two fundamentally different states of affairs, and even as one state of existence approaches a different state of existence, it still doesn't become that state of existence until something fundamentally changes. But do you know what's an even better example of that? Biological sex. Because I am a male. And there are various attributes of mine that could change to be more typical of a female, or maybe were always more typical of a female. And you know, I'm not going to list off all those attributes, but I'm sure you know what they are, and clearly they can change. Just like there are various attributes I have that could change to be more typical of that of a dead person. Like if my heart rate goes down, then it's approaching the heart rate of a dead person, which is zero beats per minute. But ultimately, what matters isn't how many of my attributes are more like that of a typical female. What matters is not how female I'm getting, insofar as we can even conceive of that. What matters is a much more fundamental question, a much more binary question, 
Am I female or am I male? Remember the light switch. We could liken me becoming more female to the circuit of a light switch becoming more closed. But however close it gets, that doesn't change the fact there is a fundamental difference between the open circuit of a turned off light and the closed circuit of a turned on light. I'm not really going to get into the science of how or why sex is binary here. The basic summary is that in all mammals, sex is defined by the gamete size of which your body is organized around facilitating the reproductive function. If you would like more details, then I would recommend the Paradox Institute, which is a YouTube channel that deals entirely with the science of sex and specifically why sex is a binary. So that would be a very good place to start. By the way, biology as it relates to sex is filled with all sorts of binaries. For example, all reproduction is either isogamous or anisogamous. There's only two options, so that's a binary. There are many other examples of such binaries, so it's not as if mammalian sex stands alone in itself as being the only binary here. Also, pregnancy itself is binary. When two people of opposite sexes come together, the female is pregnant. She isn't slowly approaching pregnancy, moving along the spectrum from less pregnant to more pregnant as reproduction happens and, you know, all that kind of stuff. No, as soon as the uh, sperm fertilizes or the small gamete fertilizes the large gamete, she is pregnant. And then as soon as she has given birth, she is no longer pregnant. There is no spectrum here. There's no movement along a continuum. It's an either or thing. Either she's pregnant or she's not. She becomes pregnant in a moment. She ceases to be pregnant in a moment. One reason why binaries are so easy to notice when we talk about biological sex is because of the aforementioned reality that binaries often exist as two complementary pairings. So because we observe that pairing so often and those two different sexes organized around two different functions coming together to achieve that function so often, it means that's a very readily observable reality. We exist because sex is binary. Every single person watching this video right now is only here because a male and a female reproduced. This is why it's so important to understand holistic function, because it enables us to recognize why biological sex exists and why it's binary, because you have the large gamete, which contains the majority of the genetic information, and the smaller gamete, which is more maneuverable and as such can actually reach the large gamete to fertilize it. Without this duality, the system breaks. A hypothetical medium gamete that has less genetic information than an egg and less maneuverability than a sperm would fail always when up against an isogamous system. It would be outraced by the sperm and outsubstantiated in terms of genetic information by the egg. It's often said that if you had a string of binary code and you added a two, you no longer have a piece of binary code. But is that true? If the point of the code is to be read by computers using binary computing language, then a two doesn't necessarily break or contradict the binary. It just gets overlooked and left behind. This is how it would be with a hypothetical third gamete. The ones have a Function. The zeros have a function. A two does not. A third gamete does not. Even if it was there, it would be ignored because it's not part of the system. And its presence, and the fact its presence would ultimately be ignored and it would just die out, speaks to the fact that what we're dealing with here is in fact a binary system. I'll close with these words from Elbo in the uses of binary thinking. It may be that the very structure of our bodies and our placement in phenomenal reality invites us to see things in terms of binary oppositions. Indeed, the very same post-structuralists who are so unhappy about too many binary oppositions in structuralism seem to invite far more of them into their model for how human language and meaning function. I do think the idea of binary as a method to understand the world is a bit wrong. Certainly, the idea that binaries exist to simplify the world is so wrong that that's actually what I'm going to be critiquing in detail next week in my video that will be a comprehensive exploration of spectra. But more to the point, binaries aren't just an optional tool in an analytic toolbox. Sometimes reality itself, undeniable material reality, will force us to acknowledge that something is a binary, independent of our categorization of it as such. I've already said that we can basically just decide that something is a binary with the old X and non-X distinction. We could, for example, decide that religion is a binary if we felt like saying there's Christianity 
and then there's everything else. We could decide that race is a binary if we just said there's white people and then there's everyone else. Sometimes inventing such a binary might be useful and it might actually be worth doing in order to explain something in a specific context, but that's not always what we're doing when we talk about something being a binary. However, despite this final quote having a bit of a wonky premise in implying that the identification of something as a binary is entirely utilitarian and volitional, it does have a pretty good point to make. Even those who say there's no such thing as a binary or are offended at the idea that binaries exist will ultimately accidentally use binaries in their thinking because the reality of binaries existing is inescapable. Anyway, I hope this exploration of the broad idea of binaries was in some way edifying. A lot of this felt kind of obvious to say, but I thought someone needed to say it, and as far as I can tell, nobody has said all of this stuff comprehensively until I sat down to make this video. So considering how much time we spend talking about is sex a binary, is sex a spectrum, I thought, yeah, maybe somebody should sit down and just say, okay, but what actually is a binary? When we talk about binary, what are we saying? And of course, I'm going to be doing that next week with Spectra. So make sure that you are excited for that. And if you haven't subscribed, of course do. Uh, like, comment, share, all that kind of stuff. I'm very interested in the comments here. Sometimes I make videos and, you know, whatever. I'm not going to say I don't care about the comments, but I, I, I'm not like thinking forward towards them actively. Uh, but then I make videos where I'm like, no, I'm really interested to see what people have to say, um, what other examples of binaries uh, people can have. I, I could almost guarantee there are going to be people with additional thoughts and I'd imagine a lot of them are going to be insightful. So that's exciting. Uh, yeah, of course, please comment. Another thing, of course, that you can do is you can give on Patreon. And if you give on Patreon, not only are you supporting this channel, which is wonderful, but you also get access to an additional uh, live reaction video that I do every single week. So I will show you the most recent example of that for you to check out now. Uh, long hair jump, jump scare. <gasps> Different views about language. I don't think that including the word typically is that problematic? I think yeah, that makes sense. So basically, because obviously my issue of using the word typically is that I do think a definition needs to categorically, I said this before, include all things that are being described by a term and exclude all things that aren't. And within that context, saying typically it just doesn't work because it's like, again, the problem is you have the, and I think I actually addressed this later on in the video, so I think I'm just repeating an argument that I make there, which is, well, if you then have something that doesn't fit the definition, does it... Uh, is that because it isn't the thing or it's just not a typical example of that thing? If that looks of interest to you, then like you, like I say, you can just uh, give on Patreon and as little as $1 a month is uh, how, how low I'm willing to go to give you this wonderful service of an extra live reaction. So uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed that and I will see you all next week.